Hello everybody, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for OnlineChessLessons.net and in this DVD we are going to talk about positional play and we'll discuss games. I'm gonna try showing you the way I think. So for this introduction I chose a game between Botvinnik and Alakine this is a classic. So knight f3, d5, and okay, white plays a different move order, but we have a queen's a, a d4 game, and soon we'll have the queen's gambit with c4. Black plays the queen's gambit declined with e6. He can also accept the gambit, that would be the queen's gambit accepted, and nowadays we'll see the slav. I mean, this is the most popular choice for black. The difference between the slav and the queen's gambit declined or orthodox difference is black can still get his bishop out before playing e6, he'll try playing bishop f5, maybe bishop e4. Therefore, his bishop will be outside the pawn chain. When he plays e6, and let us say he continues with c6, then bishop c8 is a bad bishop because it is crashing with um, the pawn structure. So knight c3, here c6 would be the semi-slav defense, bishop e7 is the orthodox, however black plays c5, attacking the center, this is the Tarash variation, and black wants, wants to trade pieces off, because he takes with the knight on d5, the main line is e takes d5, and then black has a free diagonal for the bishop. The only drawback is that sooner or later, as white, we are gonna take on c5. We don't have to take now, but I'm just showing you that black is gonna have an isolated pawn on d5. We call this pawn isolated because it can't be protected by other pawns, it can only be protected by pieces. So if we play an endgame, we'll have a big advantage as white, the only one who's able to protect the pawn is the king. So remember, against the isolated pawn, what we have to do is trade some pieces off, we also have to blockade this pawn, the isolated, therefore it uh, can't advance and well we, we have to try playing an endgame if our opponent has the isolated. In this line black wants to play solid, he doesn't want to have any weaknesses, therefore he takes with the knight and we play e3. We'll see that white ends up with the isolated pawn now. The main line is e4, and this reminds me of the Grunfeld defense. The only problem of e4 is, okay, we have a strong center, but he's trading too much, and he keeps on trading here after bishop b4 check. I mean, this is playable, but black has good equalizing chances. I have to point this out here. We have a nice uh, knight on f3. We know this knight is a good defender. It, it is the best defender if we castle, and black doesn't have this knight on f6, so he'll probably have, yeah, he'll probably have to play 
something like knight d7 and knight f6 here. If he goes knight c6, then his king side is gonna be weak. So, um, but Vinik decides to play e3. I like this move. We are not trading too much. He plays knight c6. And okay, here it makes sense for us to move our bishop on f1. If we play e4, we are gonna waste a tempo compared to the previous line. This is this is clear. We have to decide whether to play bishop d3 or maybe bishop c4. I don't like bishop e2, I think this is too passive, because he can't play bishop e4, and if we play bishop d3 we have a target, if we play bishop c4, well we also have a target. Actually, both moves are theory, so... And this is an old game, so... I mean... I like bishop c4. I'm not sure which one is better, that's what I'm trying to say. Personally, I would play bishop d3. I've seen a lot of, a lot of games with bishop d3 recently, but bishop c4 also makes uh, sense to me. The only move I wouldn't play is bishop e2. So c takes. Here we have to take with the e pawn. This would be a mistake. Because first of all, we are trading pieces off. And that is what black wants. Wants to equalize. And he also takes on c3. And now he doesn't have to take on d4. He can just play it like this and he keeps much better pawn structure where whereas we have a weak pawn on c3 backwards isolated so we take with the e pawn now our bishop c1 is also free and black decides to play bishop e7 makes a lot of sense to me because he has to stop moves like knight e5, bishop e5 maybe black can also consider taking on c3 but I think this is helping us because we bring a side pawn to the center therefore uh, d4 is protected and we don't have isolated pawns anymore. What we have here with c3 and d4, these pawns are what we call hanging pawns, especially if we play c4, because they are together, they are not isolated, but at the same time they can't be protected by other pawns. We can't play b3 nor e3. They can be protected by pieces only. But I like the hanging pawns, because they are together, they win space, they can advance, winning more space. I mean, if black takes the knight on c3, he's just helping us. His strategy... Oh, let me go back here. Yeah, c takes, e takes. His strategy uh, should be trading pieces off and playing against d4. So we castle, he castles. Here, Budvinik plays a natural move, rook e1. And apart from developing a piece, what we are trying to do here is we can consider maneuvers like this. When we attack, we have to consider 
this kind of uh, maneuvers. And this is also part of the positional play, of course. So far the game looks sharp, but we'll see um, Black makes a mistake here playing b6. I mean, the move is passive. It makes a lot of sense to place the Vesh on this diagonal. Maybe I can play knight f6, and then the idea would be playing knight b4 and knight to d5. If we play that, then we are blockading d4 successfully. And even if white takes, he can always take back with a piece. I mean, after b6, we see what Vinic takes on d5, and here black has to take with a pawn. Isolated pawns are gone. I mean, we both have the same pawn structure. The only difference is white has the initiative and much better pieces. Again, I think black should have played knight f6, maybe a6 plus b5. This is a well-known maneuver too in this position. I mean, it all comes to blockading on d5 and maybe knight takes c3. Trying to play like this and then he'll put some pressure on the hanging pawns. So b6 is a soft move here. We take he takes back and now we are not gonna play a quiet move like bishop d3 or bishop b3. We have to keep the initiative here. That is why we play bishop b5 attacking the knight. And as we said before, um, despite the symmetrical pawn structure, we have the initiative. And he plays bishop to d7. Uh, this is the second mistake in this game. He can still play bishop b7. Um, I know this move and doesn't look great. Because the bishop is on a closed diagonal, but we can see here he can still protect the knight and black has a nice resource which is a6. If we take on a6 then he plays rook a8 and we lose a piece. And if we take the knight on c6, well, he has the bishop pair. He doesn't have many weaknesses, so I guess black is fine. I would probably go bishop d3, and I'm gonna try this. I think white is still better, because we have better bishops. For instance, bishop b7, I don't like this bishop here, and he's also lacking the defender on f6. Taking into consideration all these things, I take white, but okay, I mean, black's position is playable. So bishop b7 is the move. Problem with bishop d7 is we continue putting pressure and he won't have that a6. Uh, we suggested before, he has to play something like knight to b8 and well maybe rook c8 is better looking but then we play our bishop f4 and he's in trouble because he can't move his pieces, he can't play a6. I don't think he can move the knight uh, successfully I mean, maybe knight b8. So I can consider bishop takes d7. And as you can see, the bishop on e7 is hanging in a lot of variations. And I'm also looking at this. Only move is bishop takes b5. 
we take rook takes and this is too dangerous for black I don't see a successful way of stopping knight c6 he's gonna lose a piece or this change I bet he's losing something here otherwise bishop takes d7 plus queen takes a7 that also wins the pawn so here Alakine he probably saw that yeah I, I'm sure he saw that so he plays knight b8 and okay from a defense point of view I mean this move is correct because when you're defending what you want to do is trade pieces off when you have a worse position you also have to trade pieces so we are not gonna take on d7 yet that would be developing his knight for free so we play bishop f4 we take the chance to complete our development so he takes queen takes a6 believe it or not this move is creating extra weaknesses on the queen side for for black and the only advantage I see is that in some variations he'll try rook a7 and maybe he finishes his development this way so white plays queen to a4 and we have other moves queen b3 queen d3 queen e2 the idea with queen a4 is to play against knight b8 we are still stopping knight c6 and if he plays knight d7 this move is too annoying if he plays knight f6 bishop c7 he's always losing some material and if he plays b5 then he'll have a lot of holes on the queen side we'll just move the queen and we'll punish him playing a4 so Alakine continues trading pieces off we said that was the right strategy because he's defending so we take queen takes and then we play the simple rook a c1 we are still playing against his queen side so here black tries rook a7 controlling the seventh rank and in a lot of variations he'll try rook c7 maybe rook e7 it is not clear how to keep the pressure as white because after all black has a solid position and all he needs I mean he needs a couple of moves and then he also finishes his development so I bet he wants to play rook c7 and rook e7 as well problem is we can't stop both so Budvinik plays queen c2 then he plays rook e7 I like the fact we control the c file because here we said we have a simple move a simple variation we'll see I also want to point out that if he plays knight c6 our idea is to play this and he can't finish his development yet that knight on d7 is still overloaded we have full control of the open files and maybe we can continue with rook d6 we'll win the pawn uh, one way or the other so he tries rook to e7 we take queen takes and queen c7 this is the end game we wanted to play 
a position where we have an active rook and basically he's playing down a knight. He can't finish his development and we have a lot of targets to attack. When we see this position it looks simple, however we'll see um, black defense well and we'll have to fight, I mean we'll have to work in order to win this. Black plays f6, good move, stopping both knight e5 and knight e5. And we also see that rook f7 is coming. So, well, as white we have a simple decision here, we have to bring the king to the center. And we have to play this before playing rook b7, for instance. This would be the standard mistake. I mean, I bet a lot of players are, are playing rook b7 in this position. And then black activates his rook. And suddenly things are not clear. We can try winning the pawn, but first we have to control everything. Black doesn't deserve this kind of counterplay. So we play king f1, he plays rook f7, rook c8, and here we are not repeating moves. And if we trade rooks, I mean he's basically equalizing, because he's gonna move the knight next. So we play rook c3, we win some tempos, and he can still, he can't finish his development yet. He plays e5. Um, usually advancing pawns in front of your king is not a good idea. Um, of course if Alakine played this he probably had his reasons but usually this is not a good idea because they can't go back. I mean maybe in some positions he would love playing e6. Imagine here we play Somehow we get a knight on f5, that would be a hole, h5 as well. Um, be careful when you advance pawns in endgames, or even if we are talking about middle game, later on in the endgame you'll have some leaks because of your pawn moves. So e5, maybe in this position it makes some sense to activate that position, I would try king f7 maybe. I know black's position is tough, but yeah, and the, the other move we have to analyze is knight d7. We are still dominating here. He can't reach the c file and he can't move the knight much. Little by little we continue advancing here as white. I like the rook d6 idea. So he plays e5 and this e5 is probably helping us find the next move. I, I really like this move because the knight is improving in so many ways. We can try this, we can also go to b4 and we attack on d5. Another um, aggressive move by black and again, I would have played h6. Um, I also understand the fact that black wants, wants to attack because he's been defending for the entire game. So now he's trying to show some aggression. Problem is, after this move, this great move played by Batvinik, we're gonna destroy black's pawn structure. No matter what he plays, he's going to have weaknesses. Let's see why. If he takes on h4, then we just play this. We take on h4 and then f6, h5, d5. They are all weak. By the way, he still has that weak knight on b8. If he plays e4, um, this is probably worse because then he's full of holes and I don't see him defending every single pawn here. And if he leaves the pawn there on e5, 
one day we can try taking and the e5 square is ours. So he plays knight e7. We activate the rook first. I like this because now his rook on f7 is gonna be overloaded. We play knight f3. He'll have to make a move on the king side now. And he plays e4. That is what we wanted. We wasted the tempo, but now we are sure his his pawns are quiet there, they can't move. And we just continue with our positional stuff. This, this, we are just one move away from playing knight f4, and he can probably resign. So he plays f4. I like this try by black because he prefers an open position. We don't have to make this mistake, because first of all we don't win a pawn, and even if we win a pawn, he's free in his position too much, he has some activity here, and we know rook endgames are not easy. I mean, he, he has a lot of drawing chances, We'll better play f3, we stop those pawns, and again, he can't move much. All his pieces are passive. So he plays a5, a4, every single pawn is under control, we have much more space, and it's nice to see how passive Black's position is. We have full domination here as white. Once more the knight can't move. Rook f7 can only stay on the f file protecting the f4 pawn. So he plays rook f5 and here we play b3. At some point, I believe he's gonna run out of moves. We can also consider this, but then I see knight f6, and our rook is not active anymore. What I see here is... I mean, he can only move the king, actually. He can't move the knight, and maybe if he moves the rook, You'll have to deal with some uh, moves like this too, because this time the rook is not on f5 to protect f4. I mean, this is not working because of this, so this is kind of a sux1 position. We play king e2, and okay, here black wants to activate that position no matter what. And he sacrifices a pawn. Maybe king e7 is resisting, but I understand this move knight v8. If we take on b6, this would be a big mistake. He plays king c7, attacking the rook, and he's playing knight c6 next. Then that position is not clear, and he has. Um, strong activity. A couple of moves ago the knight was not playing at all and suddenly he's playing knight c6, he's taking on d4. So when he plays knight b8 we are not allowing that and we stop knight c6 just in time. He'll have to activate the knight but he's gonna waste much more tempos here. Um, rook e7 is winning. Here white missed um, a quick way of winning the game. Rook e5. Black has to take. Otherwise we take on h5. And here, yeah, the king is it's not um, able to go to f7, so yeah, this was winning faster, but 
I mean what black what white played it's also good enough again there's nothing black can do here he can't even move the king so d5 falls and so is um, black's position it is amazing that black didn't have any chance to activate his knight in this game so he tries this and we are gonna take every single pawn if rook takes d4 this is a simple way of winning the rook is still overloaded can't move and if he does then we take f4 plus b4 so he tries rook c6 very nice technique by white here and after a couple of moves black realizes he doesn't have targets b3 is protected so is f3 and with so many with too many pawns up for white um, there's no need to continue on so I really like this game played between uh, two great players and we won't see a game like this often where white dominates in such a clear way so I hope this analysis was useful and we'll continue analyzing in the next videos thank you this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for onlinechesslessons.net First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from onlinechesslessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for onlinechesslessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.